And now, from California, the Friday play. Stanley Camel, David Ogden Styers, and William Hootkins in Victorville by Marcy Kahan. Victorville, California, on the edge of the Mojave Desert, 1940. Uh, 100,000 trees, 20,000 tons of marble are the ingredients of Xanadu's mountains. Xanadu's livestock, the fowl of the air, the fish of the sea, the beast of the field and jungle, two of each. The biggest private zoo since Noah. Then, last week, as it must to all men, death came to Charles Foster Craig. Bank? Yeah. Did you say something? Then last week, as it must to all men, death came to Charles Foster Craig. It's good. <laughs> you wrote the script, Meg. I just worked up a little parody. The pompous inversion of the phrase is the mangling of the English language. As to all publishers, it sometimes must. The paper closes. It's good. Do you need anything? Uh, I just hope the kid appreciates it. Assuming he's read it. Read it. When was it all and drove down for the pages? Wednesday? Yes, Wednesday. We've been here six weeks. Has he once phoned to find out how we are? He phones all the time. It's in the contract. We weren't to be disturbed for at least six weeks. Oh, stop being so goddamn reasonable. You said yourself he may not have read it. I'm sure he's read it. Read it, yeah. The son of a bitch should have it engraved in stone. We've saved his bacon, Jack. Do you need anything? Uh, has Rita gone? Well, she must be in L.A. by now. I told her we won't be needing her until tomorrow afternoon. I'm thirsty. Uh, I thought we would wait for the kid. Well, where the hell is he? He's always late. You'll get used to it. No, I won't. If that son of a bitch doesn't like it, we're going to take it to MGM. We don't own it. I could buy it back. I'll tell you what. Put a couple ice cubes in those glasses. Uh, Meg, let's give him another five minutes. Two huh? ice cubes each, same size cubes. Do it! Uh. All right, now fill the glasses up to the ice cube level. Uh. With water! Evenly. They, they have to be evenly. All right. There you are. Okay. Now, which do you want, the right or the left? Uh, uh, right what, or left? What are we doing? Right or left? Uh, left. Okay. Mine's the right. I bet you the ice in the right one melts first. Mang. Half a week's salary. Don't go tight-lipped and reproachful on me, Jack. I've been a good boy, stuck out here in the middle of nowhere. Nothing to spend my money on. A forsaken old cripple. You are not a cripple. You have a broken leg. Stop being so goddamn literal. Half a week's salary is $500. Really? Well, I call that underpaid. Get my lawyer on the phone. <laughs> I can't afford that kind of money. Sure you can. It'll do you good to be frivolous for once in your life. Sarah would kill me. You mean poor Sarah? She's my wife! I promised poor Sarah that there would be no carousing, no gambling, and only one scotch a day. Haven't I produced a great screenplay? You have. <sighs> Where the hell is he? If he thinks because I fractured my goddamn leg in three places I got nothing better to do than lounge around on my ass in the posture of some low-class Klondike whore. I would have said upper-middle-class Klondike whore. Yeah, well, that's because you're a scholar and a gentleman. <laughs> How are my ice cubes doing? Which one was yours? The one on the right. You're losing. Let's make it ten dollars. Two hundred and fifty. Twenty-five. Twenty-five? The kid, the kid would have bet a thousand without blinking. I am not the kid. Even so, you wish you were. Rubbish. But, naturally, I, uh, I admire him. Yeah. <laughs> ah, come on. You would trade places with him in a second. Hardly. I know him too well. Don't tell me. It's agony being a boy genius with the, uh, your adolescent mug on the cover of Time and every Dolores Del Rio in Hollywood eager to make baby genius quintuplets with you. He doesn't sleep, you know. What? You mean never? Mm -hmm. That's why he works so hard and plays so self-destructively. He believes that he is damned. Yeah, well, we are all. 
damned. No, he truly believes that Satan has got his number. That's why everything is chaos with him. Always late, incapable of bowling anything but googlies. Googlies? Curveballs. Nothing with him is ever as it seems. Well, that didn't stop you producing all his shows. We worked well together. He needed me. Sometimes he wouldn't start the rehearsal unless I was beside him. Ah. Uh, and other times? Sheer, unadulterated hell. That's because he's brilliant. Quite so. Meanwhile, we, too, cast against our will as attendant lords in Little Orphan Orson's spring pageant, we must just kick our heels in this godforsaken outpost. I like it here. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. Hmm. Anyway, I'm nobody's attendant lord. Without me, Maestro, the dog-faced boy, doesn't have a hope in hell. That's true. If he doesn't like what we've done, I'll spit in his face. He'll like it. It's a terrific script. Damn right. What time is it? Oh, Christ, he's three hours late. That is nothing. All right, all right, wait, wait. I'll tell you what. Let's drive into town, make him come looking for us. Or play his sort of game, you mean? Why bother? How much do you hate him? I don't hate him. Quite the contrary. What's the matter? Are you afraid of antagonizing him? Of course not. What exactly happened between you? They, they, they tell me that in New York you two were inseparable. Uh, Orson needed a creative sounding board, a, a canny administrator. Yeah. And what did you need? <laughs> Let's do Macbeth up in Harlem. Let's do <laughs> Caesar in modern dress. Let's do a play a week on the radio. Yeah. So? So, he shipped our entire company out to Hollywood. He expected everyone to wait around for no money while he decided what he wanted to do. When I had the temerity to remonstrate with him... You're at Chasen's? The, the upstairs room at Chasen's restaurant. He threw several dish warmers at me. <laughs> Luella Parsons says his aim was lousy. Hmm. He managed to set the curtains on fire. I left for New York the next day. I never expected to speak to him again. Oh, oh, I get it. No, all right. It, it's all my fault. Oh, oh man. I like the sound of your idea. Come on. You never really wanted to break with Orson. These days, I find myself entirely indifferent to Orson. Yeah, meanwhile, you can't stop talking about him. Neither can you. <laughs> so where the hell is he? What's your favorite book? Flaubert, L'Education Sentimentale. What's yours? Uh, Dostoevsky. No, Gogol. Dead Souls. I've never been able to finish it. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> Look at those ice cubes. What's your biggest regret? I wasted years in the grain business before I got into the theater. Why? My father was dead. I had to support my mother. Well, that's no reason. It made sense to me. You're too responsible. Perhaps. A nice Jewish boy. You? Half Jewish, yes. On my father's side. Well, that doesn't count. What's your biggest regret? Uh, staying in Hollywood all these years. I thought you would say getting married. No. No, not at all. My marriage is the best thing that happened. What's been your worst moment? Worst moment? August 1936. I had to cross the border to apply for a residence permit at the U.S. Consul in Toronto. I filled out all the forms. They said it might take months for the quota number to be cabled from Bucharest. Bucharest? Yes, I was born there. I'm a Romanian citizen. Oh! <laughs> Don't tell me this classy George Sanders accent. Is a fake? This accent is the honest result of a ten-year incarceration in a British boarding school. Oh, yeah. Tom Brown's school days. Superficially. I had a surprisingly good education. Yeah, me too. So, what happened? I had to face the fact that the book arrest office might never reply. Well, who did you wind up bribing? No one. I went back to the consulate, not expecting anything. I just felt bored and listless. And there, on the desk, was a decoded cable with my Romanian quota number. Crisis averted. That's it? That was the worst moment of your life? Well, everything I cared about was in New York. Friends, lovers, my career. I thought my life was over. 
Ice cubes. How my ice cubes doing? Nearly melted. Whose? Both. Which one's more melted? Hard to say. Let me see. How do you like that? They both melted at the same rate. What's been your worst moment? Me? <laughs> ah, too many to list. The car crash? The car crash? Serves me right for agreeing to drive all the way to New York with Tommy Phipps. You have never seen a guy so crazed with unrequited love as Tommy Phipps, his ex-girlfriend, Ethel. She sent him a note before he left. Take good care of yourself, always Ethel. So, for the first hundred miles, Phipps kept insisting that Ethel was not the kind of girl who would lightly write, always Ethel. If she meant just Ethel, she would write, Ethel. If she meant always Ethel, then he had a chance. Mind you, she might have meant, take good care of yourself, always, comma, Ethel. In which case, she really was through with Phipps, and he's, he might as well drown himself. Next hundred miles, he analyzed the word good. Because if a cultured girl like Ethel wanted to say, take care of yourself, that's exactly what she would write. But the note read, take good care, which proved that Ethel's feelings were more intense. Or maybe not. Meanwhile, every goddamn song on the car radio reminded Phipps of Ethel. Smoke gets in your eyes, ten cents a dance. Some of these days, he kept driving faster and faster. At that point, I didn't care. I figured we'd get to New York even sooner, and my agony would be over. That's when you skidded. Skidded, right, on the curve. Hit a telegraph pole, plunged down the embankment, flipped over. Were you conscious? Eyes wide open. I could hear Phipps breathing. I swear, I heard him murmur, Ethel will be sorry when she hears about this. But the doctors tell me that's impossible. You were very lucky. Ah, oh, yeah, well, I've always been accident prone. Anyway, it was thanks to Tommy that I found myself back in L.A., both physically and financially in traction. And that's when Orson dropped by, desperately in need of a man of letters to turn the murder of Roger Ackroyd into an hour of scintillating radio. You left out one of the vital clues. You know, did anybody notice that besides you, Jack? <laughs> No, that car accident was providential for our boy genius. <laughs> Swanning around Hollywood for seven months. Yeah, his name in every column. The clock ticking on his golden contract. With everything going for him except a good script. Which we have now provided. Which I have now provided in spades. So, where the hell is he? <laughs> One time, uh, we were rehearsing Faustus. Uh, nothing was going right. Orson hadn't been seen all day. Suddenly, he's there, white as a ghost. Don't tell me. He'd been visited by the real Mephistopheles. Uh, he'd got himself involved the night before with a lovely and willing ingenue. Next morning, he was horrified to discover that his bed partner was simultaneously involved with the godfather of the New York mob. He wanted us to know he was a marked man. Yeah, well, he might have been telling the truth. Rubbish! <laughs> Anything rather than admit that he'd been up all night fornicating with a drama major from Vassar. Fornicating? Is that what, you, what they call it at that fancy English school of yours? Mank, he's going to cheat you. Go to hell. When he sees how good the script is, He'll make sure your name is never mentioned, much less give you a screen credit. I know people in Hollywood, Jack. I know more people than Maestro the Dog-Faced Boy does. You signed the contract, Mank. Of course I signed. I needed the money. Uh, uh, I shouldn't be doing this. But... Uh, what the hell? Clause one. All material composed, submitted, added, or interpolated by you are now and shall forever be the property of Mercury Productions. Wait, wait, wait. Let me see that. Who, for this purpose, shall be deemed the author and creator thereof, you having acted entirely as its employee. Bullshit. I'll take this to the Writers Guild. It's the standard Mercury contract. It, there's a professor out east writing a monograph on War of the Worlds. Orson was all for it until he realized the professor intends to claim in print that Howard Koch wrote the script. Well, didn't he? Of course he did. I was there. But Orson is fighting his claim tooth and nail. Well, what about Koch? 
I mean, there must be early drafts, witnesses who can testify he did the writing. Believe me, Mank, until the night of the broadcast, when the network switchboard went haywire with hysterical callers. Yeah, yeah, it was front page news. The Martians have landed in Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Well, until the great American public went berserk, we all thought we had a pedestrian radio play on our hands. If you'd asked Orson five minutes before airtime who wrote the script for War of the Worlds, he would have told you Howard Koch and it stinks. So you guys didn't have a clue what you were doing? Not a clue. Don't. Tell Orson I told you. Now, the studio heads assume he has some kind of infallible knowledge how to galvanize the American public. Huh. So, you don't think he's a genius? Look, I wouldn't be here now. I would never have agreed to edit the screenplay if I didn't believe in him, if I didn't believe in you both. Why are you getting so excited? You're a writer, Mank. Orson hates writers. He will rob you of credit. You're trying to teach me to suck lemons? No, I simply wish to prepare Don't you for the Don't worry about me. I've met guys like Orson Christ, my own father. Really? You said your father was a school teacher. Yeah, well, he thinks I'm a bum. He thinks poor Sarah should have divorced me years ago. He worries that I'll leave my kids destitute. What time is it? Is that why you drink? I drink because I'm bored. I drink because I get too head up about things. I drink because the world is full of assholes. I drink because I used to be considered promising. I drink because poor Sarah needs something to cry about. I drink because I like drinking. You're tired. You were working half the night. <sighs> Listen. The son of a bitch tries to claim sole credit. I take out half-page ads in the trades attacking him. I get my friend Ben Heck to write a blistering expose in the Saturday Evening Post. I tell Alec Walcott to plan something in the New Yorker. Good, I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, well, this is the best thing I've ever done, Jack. This baby is going to cause a lot of guys a lot of hemorrhoids. No, you won't be lounging around the pool at San Simeon after this, Mank. Yeah, well, who knows? Maybe Hearst will be flattered. I went to so much trouble to destroy him. Get a bet on that? <laughs> wow, you think I burned my bridges with the Hearst camp? Surely that's what you intended. Hmm. I, I couldn't give a damn about W.R. But Marion Davis, uh, they, she's a great kid. So they say. The floozy in the script is not Marion. Marion is witty and generous and sensitive. When she isn't drunk. So she drinks. Marion is big enough to acknowledge that this is a good script. Mank, we ridicule her lover and portray her as a talentless, dumb blonde. It's highly unlikely she'll invite you to her next barbecue. I sent the script to Charlie Lederer. You're joking. Charlie is an old friend. Charles Lederer is Marion Davis's nephew. You know, I told him to keep it under his hat. Do you realize what you've done? I just want his opinion. Whether he thinks Marion will be offended. Mank, listen to me. Charles Lederer is the son Marion Davis never had. He will show her the script. She will show it to William Randolph Hearst, who will do everything that is necessary to close us down. You're exaggerating. How could you do this? You're even more of an hysteric than poor Sarah. What are we going to tell Orson? Orson? He doesn't need to know. Charles Lederer is courting Orson's ex-wife, Virginia. Chances are he will hear of it. Will you calm down? I'll get the script back from Charlie. Don't even mention it to Orson. He's here. I want my scotch. A thousand apologies, gentlemen. Look at him. Haven't they taught you how to shave yet? I renounce razors. Once you have witnessed my Falstaff mank, you shall thank me for hanging on to this. This... Camel's armpit. This outgrowth of luxuriant hirsuteness. Please don't glare at me, Jack. I've only been in the room nine seconds. Give a man a fighting chance. This meeting was scheduled for 4.30, Orson. Jack, my scotch? Oh, I have some of mine, Mankey. This your glass? The one on the right. Do you want it neat? Yeah. Mr. Houseman? Think. You need a glass, Orson? I'll drink it as they do in Barcelona, Jack. Straight from the hip flask. To Barcelona. 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 Now, you have to believe me, gentlemen, we set out in good time, since I know what a stickler for punctuality Sir John Houseman is. Who drove you? Alfalfa. He's gone into Victorville. We couldn't have been more than 30 minutes outside the city. I was enjoying the scenery, making the odd note on this extraordinary script. Extraordinary? What's that supposed to mean? It means out of the ordinary, Mank, from the Latin. We were making good time. In fact, we were ahead of time.
when alfalfa turns around to me and he says, bad news, we're out of gas. <laughs> now, you'd think that if a fellow has been a professional driver for 15 <laughs> years, as alfalfa has, you'd think this fellow needn't worry about his inability to tap dance, say, or uh, his ignorance of astrophysics. But the one thing you'd expect alfalfa to worry about is gas. Uh, uh, petrol to you, Jack. Having enough of it to get your boss out of the city, into the desert, and back again. But no. Oh, no. Alfalfa is indifferent to gas. So there we both are, by the side of the highway. It happened one afternoon. Exactly. Where is Claudette Colbert when you need her? <laughs> <laughs> then uh, suddenly, in the distance, the unmistakable roar of a spanking brand new Bugatti. Up it pulls as if on cue. It's a two-seater. And inside those two seats are two of the most delectable floozies this side of the San Andreas Fault. Lorelei and Dorothy. These two were brunettes. Out of juice, mister, inquires floozy number one with the incisive intelligence that would make her mother superior proud. <laughs> then floozy number two volunteers to drive alfalfa to the nearest gas emporium while I wait outside our car in the haze of the late afternoon sun with floozy number one. We get the picture, Orson. We hope she made you very, very happy. Quit rewriting my script. We're standing there in the late afternoon haze. Yeah, yeah, we've had that. And floozy number one is positive she's seen me somewhere before. Sure, Time Magazine, spring of 1938. With a voice that booms like Big Ben, but a laugh like a youngster's giggle. Troubled by his asthma, but not his flat feet. His adolescent moon face begin to resemble a Roman emperor's. Have you gentlemen finished? This girl wasn't even born in the spring of 1938. Oh, oh, uh, the, the Saturday Evening Post, last winter. Orson Welles talked like a college professor at the age of two. At three, he spouted Shakespeare like a veteran. At eight, he started fixing his own highballs. Today, at 24, he has the most amazing contract in Hollywood. Final cut, a guarantee of no studio interference once his movie's finished. But what, what has, has he, he got, got to show, show for it? it? Come on, Orson, don't leave us hanging. You don't deserve this story. <laughs> the girl is positive you look familiar. Then what? Well, young lady, I tell her, if you frequent the classical theater in New York or listen to the Campbell Radio Playhouse, you may have stumbled across my name. What is your name, mister? I tell her she's never heard of me. So, you went into a catatonic depression and that's why you're three hours late. My obscurity did not inhibit the young lady, Mankey. She offered me what tasted like Prohibition gin, then suggested that we take advantage of our chance encounter in the most physical way possible. Orson, have you read the script? The 200 pages we've been slaving over for the past six weeks? I haven't finished my story, Jack. Let him finish. This gorgeous tomato makes me this gorgeous offer, gentlemen, and I refuse. And you expect us to buy that? I explain that I am a married man, a father of one, currently in the throes of my first divorce. Throes? What are throes? Throes are when your ex-wife is demanding $50,000 a year maintenance and you're trying to settle for ten fifty. Young lady, I am in the throes of my first divorce and also concurrently distracted by a movie actress a full ten years my senior whose identity shall remain a mystery. How is Dolores? She's grand. <laughs> Floozy number one is devastated. She falls to the ground, groaning and shrieking. Now, I accept that my sexual magnetism is legendary, but even I regard this writhing and howling as a tad excessive... Appendicitis? She's pregnant. On the brink of giving birth. Are you saying you never noticed the girl was pregnant? In retrospect, I have to admit she was strangely noted <laughs> <laughs> then what happened let's talk about the script no 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 
Is the girl okay? Uh, she's fine. I got her into the car, delivered the thing with my own bare hands. It was a boy. By this time, Alfalfa and the other floozy had returned. Uh, we got her to a hospital where they, you know, they uh, cut the cord and everything. She's naming it after me. Well, she couldn't very well call him Alfalfa. Where was the hospital? I uh, want. What was the name of the hospital? More scotch, Mink. Oh, thank you, Orson. Mink has one scotch a day, don't you, Mink? Well, look at it this way, Jack. It's so late, it's almost tomorrow. Well, it feels like the day after tomorrow. You're glaring at me again, Jack. When Alan was here last week to pick up the script, he told me you'd moved Miss Del Rio into a hideaway in the hills. That is where you were this afternoon, Orson. Why not admit it? Jack. Jack, look at his shirt. He cut himself shaving. He hasn't shaved in months. Try not to faint, Jack. Shall we get to work? Hmm? It's true. You really delivered a baby in the middle of nowhere? I can't tell you how hurtful it is, Jack. Having a colleague who treats you like a naughty child, a shiftless wide boy, a congenital liar. What did you think of the script, Orson? It's too long. Up your ass. 235 pages and it's not even finished. Anything else? What do you want me to say, Jack? That it's brilliant and witty and probably the best script that's ever been written? Hand me my crutches. Because that's what I believe, Mag. I, I think it's tremendous. And Jack here will tell you I don't squander my superlatives. So we're in business? Gentlemen, would I have forsook the enchantments of Miss Del Rio for an entire afternoon to come all the way out here to tell you in person that I was pulling the plug? Orson, I was writing titles for Louise Brooks and Adolf Manju when you were still in your crib reciting Proust. So I know that when a producer begins a script conference with the words brilliant, witty, astonishing, that producer will inevitably end with lousy, crappy, change every line. Well, you know what needs to be changed. Charles Foster Craig. It's weak. Yeah, I know, but it was either that or William Randolph Hearst. How about Kane? Charles Foster Kane. It's lousy. They'll all think Kane and Abel. This is not a story about brothers. Nobody will think that. Kane with a K. Nice Irish name with a K. You never fail with a K in the name. Kane is stronger than Craig. Thank you, Jack. All right, let me think about it. Fine. Now, what happened to our idea about conflicting witnesses? Hmm? Everyone the reporter interviews is supposed to have a, a different view of the man. They all have different views. But we were going to show the same flashback three or four times, but played entirely differently. Yeah, well, I tried that. It slowed down the show. Well, I'm not sure this uh, rosebud gimmick works. What's wrong with it? Rosebud turns out to be the sled he had as a kid. What? what is I that? explained it to you on the phone, Orson. I know. I'm just not sure it works. Well, we haven't written the payoff yet. Well, what's the payoff? All right, Thompson, the reporter, goes to Xanadu to interview Raymond the butler. Well, that's where this draft ends. All right, all right. I've written the rest of it in my head. Now, the butler tells Thompson how Craig... G the cane? Cane, 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 cane. Went berserk the day Susie left him. Oh, huh. how berserk? He demolishes her room. He's off his head, pulling mirrors off the wall. <laughs> yeah, tearing down the canopy bed, knocking her stupid little knickknacks off the table. Hurling bottles of scotch across the room. <laughs> there, there are bottles of scotch hidden everywhere. <laughs> Finally, Craig... A cane? Cane, 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 cane. He picks up one of those glass globes with a winter scene in it, a, a replica of the old homestead in Colorado where he was born. <laughs> and he says... Rosebud. Which connects up with the first scene when he's dying, and he says Rosebud and drops the globe. But... Thompson, the reporter, still doesn't know what it means. It's hokey. Of course it's hokey. It's meant to be hokey. Then we show the men cataloging all the European treasures in the vaults of Xanadu, and they're burning all the worthless junk. Meanwhile, Thompson, the reporter, is admitting to his colleagues that he never found out what Rosebud meant. Then they throw the sled into the fire, the sled Charlie was playing with in the Colorado scene, when Thatcher, the banker, comes to take him away. Uh -huh. Yeah, right. And the camera moves in close, right up to the furnace door, and we can see the lettering on the sled begin to dissolve in the flames, and the word on the sled is... I don't know. What do you mean, I don't know? It's what the audience has been waiting for! Kane's childhood, the solution to the mystery. 
Okay. So he never found true love. A man like Kane isn't interested in love. Orson, I had a bicycle when I was a kid. It got stolen. My parents refused to buy me another one. I have never gotten over it. Oh, and I had a sled at the Todd School. Can't remember what happened to the damn thing. And I bet Jack had a cricket ball that he slept with under his pillow at that fancy English school of his. I was never athletic. The lost artifacts of childhood. Pure hokum. Rosebud unifies everything, Orson. It's dollar book Freud. Don't knock Freud. I was in analysis for two years. Forgive me, Mankey. But I find that hard to believe. My analyst was great. He couldn't stop me from drinking and gambling and procrastinating, but at least now I know why I drink and gamble and procrastinate. Why? I can't remember. Anyway, you're wrong about Rosebud. We need something to hook the audience. Well, what about my Coleridge quote? Your Coleridge quote is ridiculous. Why is it ridiculous? In Xanadu de Kubla Khan, yakety 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 yakety. Pleasure Dome decree. <sighs> Where Alf, the sacred, sacred river, river ran, ran through, through caverns, caverns measureless to man, down to a sunless sea. It sends shivers up my spine. Yeah, you and no one else. The great American public is not going to get excited about some guy muttering poetry every ten minutes. Give me one good reason why not. It's not cinematic. Fine. That's a good reason. Thank you. There's too much literary stuff in his script anyway. We can fix that. Well, you're going to have to fix it. All those scenes with Kane's first wife. We can shorten them. I have a better idea. We do them all at breakfast. The actors never leave the table, but each time the camera reverses, the marriage has deteriorated. Think that'll work? It's cinematic. Hmm. Didn't Thornton Wilder do exactly that in the long Christmas dinner? Don't worry, Jack. Thornton is a friend he won't mind. Hmm, I like it. It's a lot cheaper than trailing them all around Europe on their honeymoon. It'll work. What else didn't you like? You know what I did like? My favorite speech? Ah, the Cuban stuff. Dear Wheeler, you provide the prose poems, I'll provide the war. No, no, Bernstein, in the following scene. One day, back in 1896, I was crossing over to Jersey on the ferry, and there was another ferry pulling in. And there was a girl waiting to get off. All in white. She doesn't even notice him, and Bernstein says, I'll bet a month hasn't gone by that I haven't thought of that girl. You like that? Mm. It's a dime a dozen hearts and flowers, unadulterated schmaltz. You've been at this game so long, Mank, you don't even know when you've come up with something good. Oh, that's right, Orson. I needed you to rise up from the mist of Kenosha, Wisconsin, and tell me about it. I knew my life had a purpose. Now, we've got to find a different title. What is wrong with American? Too close to Hearst. That reminds me, cut the sequence where Susie's lover is murdered. Everyone will say it's Hearst and the Thomas Ince scandal. Mm -mm. You, you, you want to know the real story behind that? Hearst killed Ince himself. He suspected Marion Davies was screwing around with Charlie Chaplin. Now, Ince resembled Chaplin. From behind, anyway. And that no, that's why Hearst uh, shot him. Mankey, we are not writing the life of Hearst. Kane is based on loads of tycoons. Hampton, McCormick, Orson's insult. Orson's right, Mank. Hearst may be washed up politically, but his newspapers can still make things very unpleasant if he thinks we're having a go at him. Having a go? We're crucifying the bastard. This is a guy who is terrified of death. At San Simeon, no one is allowed to mention it. And we open with a five-minute march of time obituary of him. Oh, the march of time stuff is great. Yeah, well, Jack worked on that. It's very wicked, Jack. I only edited what Mank put down on paper. He did more than edit. Have I told you I found a cameraman? Who? Oh. Well, he came to me, actually. He'd seen Julius Caesar and Faustus in New York. Said he'd been looking for an opportunity to experiment. I told him, experiment is the word, since I know nothing about filmmaking. Who is it? Toland. Greg Toland. The Greg Toland? Well, I don't know about the others. This one got the Oscar for Wuthering Heights. He's just worked with Ford on Grapes of Wrath. So he told me. He's I... eager to get started. Has he read the script? I talked him through it. He told me to be careful of Hearst. Don't worry about Hearst. We won't hear a, a peep out of that bastard. We'll hear more than a peep if we don't cover our tracks. Hearst won't be able to say a thing. Why not? Rosebud. You think he'll be so overcome with self-pity at his lost childhood, he'll just fold up his tent? Rosebud, I haven't told you what it means. It's a sled. Oh? 
Is that so? Mankey, we're sitting here perched on our cushions, waiting with bated breath. William Randolph Hearst is in the habit of using the word rosebud as an intimate term of endearment for Marion Davis's deepest treasure. Her deepest what? Her pudendum? Is that what they call it at that fancy English school of yours? Uh, how do you know? I have it on the best of authority. He talks to her clitoris? Rosebud, by name. You're blushing, Orson. Look at him. He's blushing. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to get this clear. He has conversations with it, uh, <laughs> extended discourses, uh, a platonic dialogue. Let's <laughs> say the bastard takes us to court and we admit that we have indeed based certain elements of our story on his life. Oh, Rosebud, for instance. <laughs> He'll be the laughing stock of the country. That is assuming he even troubles to sue us. With Hurst's power, he could simply close us down. How? Luella Parsons, that infernal column of hers. Let's say she writes about how a little birdie has told her that Orson is cohabiting with the lovely and still married Miss Del Rio. Oh, she doesn't know that. Nobody does. Parsons and Hurst can concoct any scandal they like once they decide to destroy someone. The hell with them. Uh, better cut the murder sequence, though. I'll run the script past the RKO lawyers next week. Lawyers? They're always running scared. Mankey, you know me. If they tell me it won't wash, I'll tell them to go jump in the lake. I just want to hear what they say. Are you gentlemen ready for dinner? I'm starving. What say we drive into town? Mank and I have been frequenting a unique establishment known as the Green Spot. <laughs> yeah, that's what your skin looks like after you've sampled the food. <laughs> I'd love to, but Alfalfa promised to be back here soon. I have to get back to L.A. Yeah, who could blame you? Don't suppose you could rustle me up a steak, Jack? I think there's a roast chicken. That'll do. And potatoes, salad, whatever you've got. Script conference over. Uh, one last thing. The scene where Leland is drunk. He falls asleep over his terrible review of Susie's opera debut. Yeah, well, that's based on fact. They did the same thing at the New York Times. Well, I think Kane should finish the review. In the same vein as Leland, he should give Susie a vitriolic review. Kane would never do that. It's exactly the sort of perverse thing he would do. Hurst isn't perverse. He's completely predictable. This isn't Hurst. It's Charles Foster Kane. You want him to finish the review? Yes. Over my dead body. I'll go find the chicken. Stay where you are, Jack. What do you think? I can see both points of view. Oh, well, I'm the director. You're the big shot director. Well, ain't it lucky for you, you found the best screenwriter and the best cameraman in the business. Steady on, man. Don't you steady on me. I know these characters. Kane would never finish that review. Of course he would. I'm not interested in making a movie simply because Herman Mankiewicz wants to settle a lot of old scores with William Randolph Hearst. You're a bigger son of a bitch than Hearst ever was. Yeah? Well, I'm a hungry son of a bitch. I'll be right back. Try not to hit each other. Thank you. Your health. How's the leg? Still hurts like hell. The bones are knitting or some goddamn thing. The thing about Kane, he wants to win back Leland. Show him he's not so blinded by the obsession with Susie that he can't behave honorably. Hmm. But he still fires Leland. Sure he fires him. He's the boss. He won't tolerate insubordination. Ah, uh, what the hell do I know? Maybe you're right. Oh, I, I think it's more surprising my way. I get so head up about these damn characters. It's only a damn movie script. You've done an amazing job, Mank. I've enjoyed it. Good. Not often I get to work with intelligent sons of bitches. <laughs> I know. What's happening in Belgium? What? Belgium. Have the Germans invaded? Uh, any minute. They're almost in France. They say the phony war will be over by next week. Hmm. Damn Germans. I saw what was happening back in 33. Well, the sooner everything's out in the open, the better. What do you mean? Well, we've got to help England. England? What have we got to do with England? All civilized democracies. That's what you think this is? Civilized democracies versus totalitarian dictatorships? Well, that's a crude way of putting it. England is finished. 
The strength of the Berlin Rome axis is overwhelming. <laughs> Who are you quoting? Charles Lindbergh? If I want someone to evaluate the power of an enemy Air Force, Lindbergh is the best man for the job. Mankey, I thought you were Jewish. What's that got to do with anything? There is nothing in our Constitution that prevents a citizen from making a separate peace. Oh, you intend to sign your own private treaty with Adolf Hitler? Tell you what, tell you what. You stick to your poetry and your books and your fusty and melodramas. Admit it, Mankey, admit it. You are so afraid of Hitler, you think it's not even worth fighting. You are so ignorant of politics, it's pathetic. Listen, you isolationist bastard! Pig ignorance! You know who the, You know what this war is for? Yes, freedom! No! The federal government, the military, big business! Everything with you is a conspiracy! I was in Berlin in the 20s. So was I! Listen, you were six years old. How can a Jew be a, a fascist isolationist? Who are you calling a Jew? I've managed to rustle up an, an eclectic cold collision. Person, chicken. Oh, thank you. Salad here. Yeah. Uh, potatoes, careful with that plate. Mink. There was some coleslaw. I'm not sure when it dates from. Hmm. Coleslaw is surprisingly fresh. Orson. Right. Jack tells me that when you were doing the War of the Worlds. Yeah. And everyone up and down the country was in a state of hysteria because of the diabolical timing and precision of your recreation of the Martian landings. Yeah. Well, the truth was you didn't have a clue what you were doing. Jack said that? Jack said you didn't know your ass from your elbow. Is that so, Jack? It's doubtful I would have used that expression, Orson. He told me not to tell you, Orson. Did you have a second scotch, Mank, while I was out of the room? What if I did? You're not my keeper. I'm sorry you feel the need to regale my professional colleagues with tales of my creative ineptitude, Jack. I merely said how surprised we were. I can imagine what you said, Jack. I could do with some more potatoes. Yeah, finish them. Thank you. Uh, Orson, what? just now, while we were waiting for you, Mank told me something rather disturbing. What? Nothing. I think Orson has a right to be kept informed, Mank. Go to hell. Hey, what's going on? Mank sent a copy of the screenplay to Charles Lederer. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> yes, very funny. <laughs> it's true. Mankey? Go to hell. You sent the script to Charlie? Mank wanted reassurance that Miss Davies would not be offended by his satire. Oh, Jesus Christ! Charlie Lederer, that's all we need! Charlie is a writer. He won't betray us. He adores Marion. You know that. I'll Mank. get it back. What is it with you? Couldn't you keep your trap shut for five seconds? Mank obviously failed to realize the implications. The implications? I'll tell you, the goddamn implications. Charlie Lederer and my ex-wife are planning a summer wedding at San Simeon. That means nothing. Oh, tell you what, Mank, why don't you call up Luella Parsons and read her the whole thing down the phone at dictation speed so she doesn't miss a comma? Maybe I will. Jesus, Mank, what is wrong with you? I'm not talking to you. Please don't. I'm not saying another goddamn word to you. That is fine with me. Good. Perhaps Mank is right. Perhaps we're all panicking for nothing. Tell me something, Jack. Hmm? What the hell have you been doing out here for the past six weeks? I assume that question is rhetorical. The terms of your employment were crystal clear. You were to make sure that Mank produced a script on time. No drinking, no gambling, no dispatching copies of the script to the enemy camp. That's right, Orson. It's all my fault. Coleslaw. What? I want some more coleslaw. Give him some more coleslaw. You give him some more coleslaw. Well, you're sitting right next to him. I want more coleslaw. Right here. Thank you. Too much vinegar. What? The coleslaw. 
Tastes like somebody emptied a bottle of vinegar. I like it. <sighs> Maybe we're all worrying about nothing. Finally, the voice of reason. Charlie's the laziest guy in town. He won't even bother to read it. I've known him since he was a kid. He won't show it to anyone. Just be sure you get it back, huh? I'll get it back. Okay. Jack? What? Are you planning to eat that drumstick? Yeah. Chicken's not bad. Chicken's great. Mank is a tad worried about his credit with the screenplay, Orson. What? My credit. What about it? Will I get one? What has Jack been telling you, Mankey? Mank is merely wondering whether he'll get a credit now that he's written the screenplay. Mank hasn't finished a screenplay yet. This is a first draft. You're not answering the question, Orson. Do you really expect me to say that I intend to omit Herman Mankiewicz's name from the picture? I don't know what you intend, Orson. Tell us. I'm amazed. I am amazed and distressed that you think I would knowingly deprive a fellow artist... What about Howard Koch? What about him? Jack tells Jack me... Jack tells you, I'm sure Jack tells you, I have horns and a tail, and I suck the blood of widows and orphans in my spare time. I do not have to sit here and listen to this. You were the one who started this little inquisition. Mank is a tad worried about his credit. The implications of that statement are... Loathsome. Orson, what about Howard... Cut. I came out here to discuss the script, not to be put on trial. You still haven't answered our questions. I am under no compulsion to answer your questions, you meddlesome man. I am technically your employer. You have been hired to provide a script for me to direct. Mank has written it. You have edited it. Upon delivery of a complete draft, Mank will be paid a bonus of $5,000. You know what you could do with your bonus? I haven't finished. Now, technically, according to the contract, neither of you is entitled to a credit. I'm locked into this damn studio publicity machine produced, directed, written by starring horrible me. Yeah, right. You think anyone actually believes that you do everything? My hands are tied, Mankey. Those RKO men are looking for any excuse to fire me. They'll say I'm refusing to cooperate with their publicity department. Look, now he's blaming RKO. I'm not blaming anyone. In fact, I intend to ignore the contract. Not only will you get a screenwriting credit, your name will come before mine. In consideration of the quality of your contribution, not to mention your seniority. Well, why couldn't you have just said that in the first place? Well, frankly, I was wounded at the insinuation that I was conspiring to cheat a man I have been privileged to regard as my friend. Come down off your high horse. Orson, we can hardly see you from down here. What are you doing here, Jack? Aside from sowing dissension with your disapproving eyes and your catty little comments... Jack has been a great help, Orson. I don't need a character reference from you, Mank. What am I doing here? Orson clearly resents my presence. Oh, I was the one who flew to New York, Jack, specifically to invite you to be out here with Mank. Listen, just listen. The fancy school I went to, you both teased me about, wasn't fancy. It was called Clifton College. It taught me that men should deal honorably with each other. And I'm a snake in the grass. This isn't about you, Orson. I'm talking about me. I was a fat little Romanian boy with a French accent. But from the age of eight, it was drummed into me that service to something greater than yourself is why we are here. They were training you to be a colonial administrator. Yes, I suppose so. And I ended up halfway across the world founding the Mercury Theatre with Orson Welles. And it was the most glorious time of my life. Oh, what am I supposed to say? That I appreciate your help? I, I shouldn't have to spell that out. I'm just tired of defending myself all the time. So am I. You shouldn't be so eager to stir things up, Jack. I stir things up, Orson, because I know you. I know you too well. Well... Maybe you should try knowing me less well. Meaning? It means whatever you want it to mean, Jack. What's for dessert? Uh, Rita has left us a blueberry pie. Oh, 
My favorite. Your favorite is triple pistachio ice cream. That's ice cream. We're talking pie. Well, God bless Rita. Yeah, I'll second that. Careful with that plate, Frank. Please. I've got it. I've got it. Uh, <clears throat> best pie I've ever had. No kidding. Tell me, Orson, what kind of pies do you think Dave Chasen sells more, a blueberry or apple? An apple, no question. Care to bet on it? Sure, why not? Mank, you promised poor Sarah. This is not gambling, it's gastronomic investigation. How much are you in for? My delivery bonus. Five thousand? Mank, you mustn't do this. You've worked too hard. Orson, is it a bet? Oh, no, can do, Mankey. It was different when I was a run-of-the-mill married man with a kid to support. But now that I've saddled myself with a mistress, five thousand wouldn't settle her monthly lingerie bills. So, next month she won't wear anything. Mankey, the reason I moved in with Miss Del Rio isn't her mind, or her smile, or her hair. It's entirely to do with... Her lingerie. God, you have no idea. Right. I keep forgetting I'm collaborating with a schoolboy. An older man. Twenty-five next month. What will you do when you're thirty, Orson? Oh, when I'm thirty, that reminds me. My five-year plan. Your what? A press release, rough draft. Alfalfa? Damn. Now hold your horses, I'll be right out. Now, I want to hear your thoughts about this. We're all ears. John Houseman, Herman J. Mankiewicz, and Orson Welles announced the formation of United Pictures. UP will present for Pacific Coast Runs five new productions a year. Did you say five? Five productions a year, originating in Hollywood, operating in partnership with the Mercury Theater, to be directed and produced by Mr. Wells. Hmm, huh. sounds fine to me. Jack? As you know, I've been developing my own projects. Oh, anything you uh, care to talk about? Orson, there are several issues we need to clarify. I'll phone you in a day or two, Mankey. I'm grateful. Huh? I'm deeply grateful. When will you uh, have the final pages? Monday at the latest. Good man. Orson? Yeah? Who are we going to get to play Charles Foster Kane? Oh, we'll think of someone, Mankey. We're... We're bound to come up with someone. <laughs> well, that was fairly successful. Um, was it? Hmm. He likes the screenplay. Yeah, well, you didn't have to bother him about Charlie Lederer. Cheer up, Meg. Mission accomplished. Yeah, well, RKO could still pull the plug. You don't know studios. Not this time. With your script and Greg Tolan on board, I wish I could go back to town with you and be part of it. Why can't you? In New York, I was three-quarters collaborator and one-quarter whipping boy. That ratio has been reversed now that we're in Hollywood. Well, it seems to me you can dish it out when things get rough. It takes more out of me than it does him. That's why he'll always win. Huh. What's going to happen to Orson? Think he'll burn himself out? <laughs> He's burned himself out at least three times since I've known him. Son of a bitch always bounces back. <laughs> What do you think he'll do tonight? I should think that would be obvious. Yeah, well, if I know him, he'll sit down and tear the whole script to shreds, prove that it's unplayable, unspeakable, uncinematic. Orson is a megalomaniac, but he's not stupid. Okay, okay. Then he'll drive to the Hollywood Bowl, where he'll perform an impromptu recitation of the Iliad to a rapt and awestruck audience. <laughs> in between donning his magician's cape and sawing Mr. Del Rio in half. <laughs> At which point, he will vanish into the night, his hairy adolescent moon face reappearing with the sun over downtown Los Angeles. Knowing on a rare T-bone? Two rare T-bones, one in each jowl. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, do you need anything? No, I'm fine. Yeah. I'll say good night then. Don't wake me tomorrow. Well, not to worry. I intend to have a lie-in myself. Good night, man. Sleep well, Jack. Mm. 
Orson went back to L.A. and made Citizen Kane. In spite of what he said in Victorville, he tried to take my name off the credits, but I outsmarted him. The picture won only one Oscar for best original screenplay. I never wrote anything that meant as much to me as Citizen Kane. I died 12 years later, age 56. Charlie Lederer read the script that Mank sent him and was very upset. He showed it to Marion Davies, who showed it to Hearst, who waged covert war against Citizen Kane. The premiere at Radio City Music Hall was suddenly cancelled. Other theatres were reluctant to show it. The picture failed, commercially, but consolidated the legend of Orson Welles. Before my death in 1988, at the age of 86, I enjoyed a distinguished career as a film and theatre producer and, late in life, as an actor. I won a Best Supporting Oscar in 1973 for my portrayal of a ferocious Harvard law professor in The Paper Chase. My guest at the awards ceremony was Sarah Mankiewicz, Herman's widow. As I left the podium clutching my gold statuette to the roar of a standing ovation, I couldn't help wondering, is Orson watching? Before my death in 1985, at the age of 70, I directed The Magnificent Ambersons, Journey into Fear, It's All True, The Stranger, The Lady from Shanghai, Macbeth, The Fellow, Confidential Report, Touch of Evil, Don Quixote, The Trial, Chimes at Midnight, The Immortal Story, and uh, F for Fake. I do not wish to talk about Citizen Kane. In Victorville by Marcy Kahan, Herman J. Mankiewicz was played by Stanley Camel, John Houseman by David Ogden Stiers, and Orson Welles by William Hootkins. Casting was through the cooperation of the Mark Taper Forum, Los Angeles. Artistic Director, Gordon Davidson, and Casting Director, Stanley Sobel. The Director was Ned Chaillet.